In this video, we will be discussing on flow volume loops. For better understanding, please watch the previous video on lung volumes and capacities. Let's plot the graph. The volume in liters is plotted along the x-axis. It should be noted that normally we plot the volumes in liter along the x-axis in the ascending order, but it is not done in that way here. Here, the volume is plotted from the right to the left side, as shown. Flow rate in liters per second is plotted along the y-axis. The part of the y-axis which is above the x-axis marks expiratory flow length and the part of the y-axis which is below the x-axis is inspiratory flow length. In the flow volume loop, the inspiratory flow during the maximal forced inspiratory effort is plotted. And in the same way, the expiratory flow during the maximal forced expiratory effort is plotted. Why does the inspiratory loop starts at this point in the x-axis? Note this point in the volume time graph also. It denotes the residual volume. That is the volume of air remaining in the lung after a maximal forceful expiration. Let's complete the inspiratory flow loop. After the maximal inspiration, now the person forcibly expires. This volume of air expired is called the forced vital capacity or the vital capacity. The forced vital capacity together with the residual volume is called the total lung capacity. The inspiratory curve is symmetrical and saddle shaped. The expiratory curve has an initial rapid rise phase. The peak of the curve denotes the peak expiratory flow rate. Then it is followed by a linear fall till the patient exhales towards the residual volume. The initial rapid expiratory phase is effort dependent and the latter linear phase is effort independent. That is, it depends on the elastic recoil of the lungs and the airway resistance and it doesn't depend upon the expiratory effort. Let us just compare the flow volume loop during the maximal inspiration and expiration with the flow volume loop formed during a normal quiet respiration. This is how it looks. See the difference? The change in the shape of the flow volume loop can aid in diagnosis and localization in the airway obstruction. Let's discuss this now. In case of obstructive lung diseases like emphysema, asthma, the inspiratory curve is usually normal. There is decrease in the expiratory flow rate. The effort independent part of the expiratory curve becomes concave upwards. As mentioned, this part of curve depends on the elastic recoil of the lungs and airway resistance. In emphysema, as there is a loss of lung parenchyma, there is less lung recoiling. So, the expiratory flow rate is reduced. And also due to secretions and bronchospasm, the airway resistance is also increased. So, this decreases the expiratory flow rate thus leading to this concave upward facing effort independent part of the expiratory curve. Since there is more air trapping in obstructive lung disease, the residual volume increases and thus total lung capacity also increases without much change in the forced vital capacity. In short, the loop shifts to the left of normal. If we see this in the expired volume to time graph, there is decrease in forced expiratory volume in the first second and the forced vital capacity remains almost normal. So the ratio of FEV1 to FVC is less than 0.7. Let's move on to the restrictive lung diseases like interstitial lung disease. Here there is decrease in the compliance of the lungs. but the elastic recoil of the stiff lung is normal or increased. So these patients can easily breathe out. As these patients can breathe in only less volume of air, the inspiratory curve is normal in contour but reduced in size. And since the elastic recoil in interstitial lung disease is increased, the expiratory curve is taller with steep descending limb. But the overall size of the expiratory curve is smaller than normal due to decreased amount of inspired air. So these patients have reduced forced vital capacity, reduced residual volume and also reduced total lung capacity. In short, the loop shifts to the right of the normal. If we see this in the expired volume to time graph, there is decrease in FEV1. But this decrease is proportional to the reduction in the forced vital capacity. So the FEV1 to FVC ratio remains normal. Or when there is more reduction of forced vital capacity than FEV1, 
then the ratio is more than normal that is more than 0.7 let's move on to localization of airway obstruction by flow volume loops first we will discuss about variable extrathoracic obstruction like laryngomalacia vocal cord abnormalities and tracheomalacia of extrathoracic trachea during inspiration there is a negative intraluminal pressure so this in combination with the higher atmospheric extraluminal pressure there is more airway narrowing in the extrathoracic part of trachea so the inspiratory flow rate is decreased but during expiration the intraluminal pressure is more than the extraluminal atmospheric pressure so the airway expands and there is no change in the flow rate during expiration Next, we'll discuss about variable intrathoracic obstructions like tracheomalacia of intrathoracic trachea and tracheal tumors. During inspiration, the extraluminal pressure, that is pleural pressure, is negative when compared to the intraluminal pressure. So, there is no flow obstruction during inspiration. So, the inspiratory curve is normal. But during expiration, the extraluminal pressure, that is the pleural pressure, is positive and it is more than the intraluminal pressure. So, it causes tracheal airway narrowing and there is reduction in the expiratory flow rates. In case of fixed airway obstructions like tracheal stenosis and goiter compressing the trachea, there is fixed stenosis of the airway. So, both the inspiratory and the expiratory flow rates are reduced. Thus, the loop looks like this. So, we finished the video here. Hope you enjoyed watching this. See you soon in the next video. And thank you.